continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and for all of the 45 years since I began this program in May 1956, I've witnessed an unending stream of indignant public officials year after year, decade after decade, decrying the ever harsher content of entertainment mass media and their destructive impact on our national life. Yet on the screen, the movie screen, the television and home video screen, and now the computer screen. Things have gotten discernibly worse, not better. Indeed, as recently as September 2000, when Senator John McCain's Commerce Committee held hearings on a Federal Trade Commission report concerning the purposeful marketing to our youngsters of violence the media themselves had identified as basically off-limits to them, it was good old South Carolina Senator Fritz Hollings who said, here we go again, then counted off the many similar congressional hearings into media atrocities over the years, leading one to wonder if as little would come of this inquiry as had come of all the others in the past half century, some 20 of them held by the Senate Commerce Committee itself. Which is not, I think, an unfair question to put to my guest today, who when the FTC reported its appalling findings and the committee, led by an angry John McCain, fired its pointed questions at industry honchos in September 2000, was very much in the public eye as the Democratic Party's vice presidential candidate, United States Senator Joseph Lieberman of Connecticut. Besides, often referred to as the conscience of the Senate, Joe Lieberman has a long history of pulling no punches and excoriating media moguls for the ever stronger violence, more explicit sex, and harsher language that they serve up as entertainment for Americans, young and old. So that my question to the Senator remains, will as little result from this congressional inve investigation of the media as from all the others? And I ask, not only as one who has lived through and taken hopeful note of them all, alas, to no avail, but as one who chaired the motion picture industry's voluntary rating system for 20 years, also perhaps to no avail. Senator, what's going to happen? Uh, thanks, Dick, for that very uh, thoughtful introduction and question. Um, I, look, I've been at this for about eight years now, and I dated from the age of my youngest child, who's now 13. She was five. Uh, I saw her watching television with one of her older brothers, 12 years older. They were watching Married with Children. Not the worst show on television, but raunchy, disrespectful. My 17-year-old, I have to assume that we've trained him well enough to be able to laugh, filter it out, and not be much affected by it. But that wasn't the role model I wanted my five-year-old daughter to see. And I began to watch television, talk out about it, talk about video games and movies. And it, it seemed to me that um, that the entertainment culture was sending messages to all of us, but particularly to our children, about sex and violence and, and uh, civility, language that, that were harmful. And that I had the opportunity here, and, and in some sense the responsibility, to speak at, out on behalf of parents who were otherwise voiceless. I, I will remember a, a, a moment in a, in a supermarket in New Haven where I live where a woman stopped me after I began to talk about this and said, please don't stop trying to get the entertainment industry to clean up its act. I feel as if I'm in 
a competition with the entertainment industry to raise my children, and I'm losing because their 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 message is much more attractive and interesting for my kids. So uh, that's how we started. It's been uh, at times very frustrating. At times, I felt we've made some progress. It's a it's a a difficult, delicate area because in one sense, I'm trying to be a spokesperson, an advocate. I'm trying to, if you will, uh, and this may seem naive. Uh, appeal to the uh, the leaders of the entertainment industry, draw some lines, think about the impact what you're doing has on our culture, on our on our kids. Don't do anything just to make another buck. Um, on the other hand, and because I believe so much in the First Amendment, I've tried to be very careful about ever getting close to censorship. So the most we've done through law is to ask, to require really the television stations to rate their shows, to put the V-chip in the, in the uh, television sets that are coming out. Overall, uh, I feel as if we've made some progress, but overall, uh, there's still a lot of uh, uh, terrible material uh, out there in the culture, and much worse than it was. I, I always say to people, I'm a child of the television age. I love television. I grew up uh, in a house where Channel 13 was right there next to the New York Times as the standard of excellence, you know, with my mom and dad. Um, and those standards uh, have dropped on most of broadcast television. In this particular case, though, I think we're going to uh, see any change to respond to your specific question. I actually think we already have seen some change, though not enough. Uh, the, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, uh, found very powerful evidence, just as you said, Dick, that the entertainment industry, m movies, video games, records were rating their product as appropriate only for adults and then turning around and marketing in places where they know kids are watching or reading television mtv uh, magazines that kids read uh, kids under 17. in response to the uh, report um, the video game industry interestingly did the most they were most responsive they did what the ftc asked they've adopted a code of marketing all their manufacturers subscribe to it and it has sanctions in it. It's self-enforcing. We'll see how that goes, but that's a good first step. The, the motion picture industry didn't adopt a code of marketing, didn't have self-enforcement in it, but some they've adopted a 12-point plan which moves in the right direction, not far enough. Most significantly to me, three of the studios, uh, Warner, Disney, and Fox, have in fact said they're going to stop advertising where kids are dominantly the audience for R-rated uh, movies, and they have done that. You know, we see it in the uh, in the revenue ad revenue reports from MTV, for instance. Warner and Disney are not advertising there anymore. So, I think we've made some progress, but the record industry has done hardly anything at all, and uh, they're they're the worst, and they really need to be uh, to be pressured. And this is why I put in a, a legislation, a proposal, anyway that the FTC be given the authority to actually take legal action against entertainment producers who themselves, not government, themselves say this product is not good for kids and then turn around and market it to kids. To me that's deceptive advertising and it's not censorship because the rating and the production is all up to the entertainment industry to ask uh, them to be honest about what they're producing and rating and to hold them accountable if they don't. So bottom line, we've made some progress got a long way to go. This is all about the pressure of quarterly income reports for the big corporations. Uh, you know and I know that human history tells us that um, if, you, if you're trying to be cautious about r making money, that usually sex and violence can find an audience, and uh, regardless of whether it's really good for the rest of, of us and our kids. But then you're dealing with the phenomenon that uh, it isn't just marketing. Is it essentially marketing that you're concerned about, or is it the content itself? And I know when you mention content, content the, the hackles raise, and you think about censorship, but it is the content sure it is. that disturbs you and disturbs me. No question about it. And here's where I try to distinguish between, <clears throat> some, some say I can't make this distinction, but I think I can. My, my role as a senator and a public advocate or an advocate for the public, uh, which is really to appeal to, to shine the lights of publicity on, on some of the junk that's being produced and, and the effect it has on kids, 
on the one hand and on the other being a legislator. And when it comes to legislating, um, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in content. But I think the, the studies are, are so increasingly clear that obviously not every child who watches a violent movie or plays a violent video game is going to become violent. But the, the studies show that, that violence in entertainment has an effect on kids' behavior. If, if they're steady and balanced kids, it may have no effect or it may make them slightly numb to violence in their own lives. If they're vulnerable, it can, it can lead them to act. And in the worst cases, of course, it could lead them to act horrifically as in the schoolyard killings. It's, it's quite uh, unsettling, quite stunning that in most of the dramatic cases over the last two or three years of, of children going to school and shooting other children or teachers, that those children were almost hypnotically uh, I engaged in one or another form of violent uh, entertainment. So, I mean, I think the case is out there, and uh, the question is whether the folks in the entertainment industry will act responsibly. What's your bet? Uh, the, record is, the record is mixed, you know. I went out to uh, Hollywood and met with some of the folks. I found the directors and the uh, creative artists very concerned about this, wanting wanting to draw some lines, very concerned about the rating system that you used to be involved in, feeling that the R rating, this is the directors and the creative artists, the R rating essentially has no meaning anymore because some, uh, what is it, 70 or 80 percent of the films that come out right. are rated R, so it, it can be an R that's, uh, it can be a real hardcore R or, or hardly an R and it's, it doesn't convey as much. And the NC-17 no one uses because I gather that it, it kills a movie. The theaters won't take it if it's a, a, a NC-17. So um, there's a lot of very encouraging agitation going out on, in the, on out there in the creative community. But you know, among the people who are on the business side, as one of them said to me, whose studio really has stopped advertising in places where kids are watching, stopped advertising R-rated material where kids are watching. Um, he said he knows he's doing the right thing, and yet on the other hand, he, from the corporate executives above him, he's under great pressure every three months to produce higher and higher profits, and that's, that's the challenge. And of course, the, the writers, don't forget, write the garbage, yeah. and the directors mm -hmm. direct the films being made or the television shows being produced in such a way as to get the larger and larger audiences. Now, you talk about not wanting ever to get into uh, the censorious yes. uh, area or be considered a censor, but there certainly now is a new school of legal scholars, uh, Owen Fiss at uh, Yale, um, others around the country, younger people, who think there needs to be a newer interpretation of the uh, First Amendment which you, I'm sure, don't believe is a uh, suicide document. The First Amendment? <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very hesitant to, to go down this road. You know, I, I've said to the folks in Hollywood, when, when we've had meetings or exchanged letters, I've said, look, I, I, I appeal to you to take some action uh, to draw some lines here. You know, one of the answers that they've given us periodically, well, I'd like to, but my, uh, my competitors and the other Studios are all doing this. So I've, are, are the other TV networks, or the other uh, video game makers, or the other record are all doing this? I've got to do it. So then we've said, why don't you go back to the to the codes that used to exist in television and movies, where essentially the industry drew lines around itself and said, okay, we're going to compete, but only within these lines of propriety and decency. Well, uh, they said um, that we would probably be sued for antitrust violations. So then. A colleague of mine, Sam Brownback, and I put in legislation which exempted them from antitrust suit if they were getting together to do this kind of uh, cooperation in, a, in the public interest. Um, it, it, they opposed it. It didn't happen. They've still not, uh, uh, not cleaned up their, uh, their own act. But that's the way it ought to happen. I'm, I'm very hesitant to have anybody in government decide what's appropriate and what's not. Now, th I must say that the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, as you know, because radio and television are over publicly owned airwaves as opposed to movies that are privately owned and, and records, of course, that are played at home. Uh, the, the FCC actually has standards on, according to which it can take legal action 
against those who, who violate them, go beyond what is, well, go into the area of, of real por pornography. And every now and then you'll hear, you know, Howard Stern was sued a few years ago and his uh, company uh, paid a fine. There are some very provocative uh, lawsuits by private litigants that are now being uh, filed against entertainment industry uh, companies that produce products that the litigants, the plaintiffs feel, affected someone who had an adverse effect. I mean, in the worst case, I forgot the state, but um, I, I did a Nightland show a while ago on this where a young girl was a teenage girl was essentially abducted and killed in a, in a satanic cult killing, which, which w went according to a, uh, very, very similar to a, a, a music uh, sung and played by a group called Slayer, which is very aggressive, ultra violent, and to, uh, to which these boys who were involved, teenage boys, were devoted. And they, they actually killed a girl and um, raped her multiple times. Um, they were apprehended, and uh, they're now serving jail sentences, but the parents of the deceased girl are now suing the record company that produces th this music by Slayer. Uh, two things. One is to hold the company account liable for damages for the loss of this girl's life, and second, to uh, as a second element of, of, of the remedy they're asking, uh, to require that uh, the company stop marketing this stuff to kids. So there are ways in which this is happening. Now, I just don't, I mean, that, that people are trying to hold the entertainment industry accountable, trying to get into the matter of content and consequences of content. Uh, but um, I, I'd hate to see the government itself do it. I say to the movie people, I complete the thought, I, I'm pleading with you to draw a line. Uh, I believe in the First Amendment, but let me, let me tell you, and this is not a warning, uh, I say to the folks there, um, behind me, as it were, if, we, if this doesn't work, I fear there's a next generation of people who are actually going to come and set up boards of censors to stop you from doing what you want, because the harm is too severe to our society. You say the harm is too severe. Uh, does that mean you see a clear and present danger? To well, our society. Well, I, I look a, a couple of things. First, uh, if, if I find that people are very concerned about the values climate in our country, and uh, even at times when the economy has been doing well, people have an unease about our country's future because of their unease about the, the moral climate, the values climate. I personally believe, in my conversations with people. Um, vindicate or validate this, that a lot of that has to do with, with the entertainment culture. That the culture is so pervasive and it sends such a message of uh, anything goes. And, uh, you know, the, the, the explicit sexual uh, depictions on television, for instance, without our conversation, without any uh, description of the consequences, you know, uh, violence is made. Uh, uh, cosmetic. So I think that uh, this is part of the climate of, of uh, moral anxiety uh, that the entertainment culture contributes to greatly. Also, again, just briefly, the studies do show by the social scientists, not by the politicians, that uh, that the entertainment can affects behavior, and uh, and we're all citizens. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, a, a very loud voice in that village today is the entertainment industry. Louder in many cases than parents or teachers or clergy. Going back to Fritz Holling's point, over the past 50 years, this has been demonstrated again and again and again. When do we bite the bullet yeah. and do something more than implore people who say, we're not nannies, we're not the nation's nannies. Right. We are businessmen and the business ethic, the business of America, famously said right. a long time ago, is business. Yeah. This is our ethic, not to be uh, guardians and nannies. Yeah, well, this is a classic case of, of another old saying, which is that the, the, market is a magni the free market is a magnificent mechanism for economic growth. And, uh, but the market has no conscience, and uh, that, that's why we have to appeal to people in the market to have a conscience. Usually the law comes along to create a conscience in the market. And that's the problem here because of our fear of legislating because of First Amendment concerns about expression. I'll give you another example. What do I mean? For a long time, 
because it seemed easier and it certainly was less expensive, uh, businesses were polluting the air and the water because it was the easiest thing to do. Um, time passed, uh, science, medicine, people began to fear that not only were they destroying our water, beautiful waterways, et cetera, et cetera, but they were hurting our health. So laws were adopted. Laws expressed this value that you can't do this. Uh, this is without conscience. The law is going to tell you you can't do it. And over time, uh, we actually created through the law an ethic where businesses began to want to uh, uh, identify themselves as green. Now that didn't involve uh, First Amendment rights, uh, although there are certainly people who will tell you, and I'm one of them, that the kind of cultural pollution that too much of the media puts out today has consequences that in their own way are as serious as the environmental pollution that we've legislated against. And the question is whether in a free society um, where we, we want to give the benefit of the doubt to expression, we can find a way to draw lines before we do ourselves in. I'm, I'm not apocalyptic. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an optimist, but I just, Dick, as we were talking, I just, somebody a while ago gave me a copy of Will Durant's uh, history of Greek civilization. He has a, a line in there that says, uh, nations are born stoic and die epicurean. Now that, that's, a, that's an overstatement perhaps, but there is some truth to it. And uh, epicureanism means many things, but, it, but in one area I think it means the loss of a sense of right and wrong, the loss of limits, and uh, that's where we have to ask for more cooperation from the entertainment industry. I must admit that I'm puzzled by the fact that you say these things yeah. and you indicate you have to ask for cooperation from the entertainment industry, but you have here and in so many other places indicated that the bottom line is the bottom line for the entertainment industry as it is for so many other areas in our lives today in this country and in many other countries because we've exported yeah. not just democracy but um, our marketplace system. But I asked you the question before <clears throat> about a free, a, a clear and present danger involved in what you described when you watched your then five-year-old daughter watching this mm -hmm. material. If it is a clear and present danger, haven't we long since established room to move uh, in the area of Bill of Rights, First Amendment considerations? Yeah. Don't we have to bite the bullet at yeah. some time? Well, certainly, uh, I must say that my own, and here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the Constitution. Uh, my daughter watching uh, and married with children uh, is not a clear and present danger. It's, uh, it, it, it gives her messages I don't want her to have, and that's where my responsibility as a parent uh, comes in. And, and of course, we're asking more responsibility from the entertainment industry. Obviously, we also need to ask it of uh, of parents uh, as well. But so, Columbine, yeah. clear and present danger? Well, look, there is stuff that is that is over the edge. You know, there are some video games. I saw a video game called Soldier of Fortune a while ago. Uh, it's, it's, first of all, the, the, uh, the technology has improved so much that the video games, which when I started this eight years ago, started got interested in this, were m largely stick figures. Uh, uh, video games now, the, the characters in it look real. And uh, in this video game, you know, you're, you get points for going through a, se a series of scenarios with a character, and the more people you shoot, the more points you get. But it's not just shoot. They're down. You go over and bludgeon them. You cut their head off. You fire until their limbs come off. It is bizarre and extreme. Now, to me, that's over the edge. And yet, would I pass a law saying it was illegal? I, 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 I'm not ready to do that. When will you be ready? What will make you ready? Four columbines in a row? I don't know. I mean, this is this is the problem. Um, and listen, it's, it is in fairness, but I don't want to show too much fairness. There's more than entertainment culture that goes into creating a couple of teenage boys who do what happened at Columbine. I mean, there's something either in them genetically or in, in their upbringing. There, there's something wrong in the school that didn't identify these kids as potential murderers and try to come in with um, with assistance to them psychologically and of course there's something wrong where they could gain access to the weapons with which to carry out that deed. There are all those things that are wrong in yeah. so many different areas but now we're talking about the entertainment world if we can call it that the world of entertainment. Yeah. 
And I wonder whether the notion that we in this country adopted more than a century ago of moving from buyer beware to seller beware, whether that doesn't have to enter into our considerations more powerfully now. How would you do it? Well, I don't know that I'd start with government. Yeah. But certainly uh, the, the whole concept of looking to outside blue chip, uh, blue blooded regulatory apparatus mm -hmm. might be tried. And I don't know that the mm -hmm. Congress has begun that as yet. Somewhere behind there, there has to be the bite that does say, yeah. If this isn't done, yeah. if a change isn't made in real time, there is going to be a clear and present danger based, not suspension of our constitutional guarantees. You and I don't want that. No, of course not. And, that, and that, that's what inhibits us. You know, that's why this uh, wave of lawsuits, private lawsuits filed against uh, entertainment companies based on the impact of the entertainment may be a constitutionally uh, acceptable way to hold uh, co entertainment companies accountable w where they hurt, which is financially. And uh, in, the, in the near term, uh, in addition to all the work that we're doing to try to badger them to require more information, better ratings, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, perhaps in a more aggressive FCC when it comes to uh, television and radio, that, that may be the, the the, the most immediate way through private litigation that we can bite the entertainment industry and, and, and shake it up so it may draw some lines. Unfortunately, we're being bitten now by a sign that says our time is up. Oh, but that I went very quickly. It did. It was a very good discussion. If I could get you to stay and do another program, if you can, we shall. But thank you again for joining me today, Senator Lieberman. Thank you, Dick. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.